Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you. Welcome. Glad to have you here. I, uh, I'm quite looking forward to hearing what these folks are going to say. You know, I was going to say, this is like a typical CSIS event. You know, looks like an old Dutch master's print with a bunch of grumpy old white guys sitting on one side of the table, except we've updated it here. And we've got a grumpy old white girl, too. No, I'm just teasing, teasing, teasing. Uh, no, actually... <laughs> uh, so I, th I think it's going to be a very interesting conversation. Uh, obviously, we're all trying to figure this out. Um, the, uh, there's a certain sense of uh, unreality to what we're looking at because we just don't know if this, in any sense, represents. Uh, you know, in the past, the president's budget was really a legitimate starting point for a serious debate. We don't know if it's going to be that way this year. And it's a very interesting question. And these five leaders are going to tell us. So who starts this thing? Is it Kim? You're in charge. Take it over. Thank you. I apologize for holding everybody up. <laughs> well, thanks, John. Uh, and good morning, everybody, to CSIS, to our discussion of the implications of the FY14 defense budget. A uh, bef couple of administrative issues before we talk more substantively. Please turn off your cell phones or any devices so it doesn't disrupt the the uh, proceedings. I want to all also point out to you a, a new publication that we've just put out, which is a methodology for uh, making the right trade-offs of defense in, in the uh, decade ahead. Uh, Clark Murdoch and Ryan Crowdy uh, did this. Very helpful, probably really very beneficial, I think, to the department. I think there are copies outside, so please take a look at it. It's, it's useful. Um, we'll, after the, each individual up here, not me, uh, has something substantive to say, we'll, we'll go to questions. We'll take them from the floor in the normal manner, which is please hold up your hand. Uh, you'll be recognized and get a microphone and then uh, give us your name and affiliation. Um, as Dr. Henry put it, he, he called it unrealistic. I, it is all of that. Unique, I guess, would be a kind way. Some would call it strange. They might choose to call that, <coughs> pick those that term. The process is strange and the substance is strange. Even today, the department doesn't know what FY13 looks like because they haven't submitted to the comptroller or haven't gotten approval from the comptroller for what the sequestration cuts are. So even today, the 13 program is in flux, uh, let alone the 14 program that, that we're going to look at. In the midst of all this uncertainty, and it's enormous, there is one certainty. And it's the sequestration number for defense. That has not been changed or proposed to be changed by anybody. So that, we know, will be at the end of the year, unless the law is changed, that will be the, the top line for defense, which is, has enormous implications. Um, we have a great group to discuss that this morning. Uh, David Berteau, who is the director of the International Security Program here, will start us off with a broad look at the budget, the numbers, and some of the implications that flow from that. Dr. Marin Lead, who is with, is a senior advisor who is with the uh, Harold Brown Chair on uh, Defense Studies and leads our Ground Forces Dialogue, will follow on the author, authorizing part of that process. Uh, Jim Dyer, now with the Podesta Group, senior advisor at uh, CSIS, extensive experience on the Hill, as, by the way, does Marin, uh, extensive experience on the Hill and in the White House, uh, will talk to us a little bit about the appropriations process where he was the chief clerk of the House Appropriations Committee for 10 years and so knows the really ugly details of how it all works. And then uh, Clark Murdoch, Dr. Clark Murdoch, who is a, also a senior advisor, will kind of roll this into a strategic framework. What, what does this all mean in terms of the strategy for the country and what, what this implies for what our national security program will look like? So without further ado, let me turn to David to kind of set the stage for us. Thank you, Kim. Um, for those uh, viewers who are joined us on the web, I think you can download these charts uh, from some convenient spot on the website there and, and follow along. Um, I have a clicker, so I was about to say next chart, but that's actually my job to go to the next chart. Uh, so I'm going to just really look at sort of where are we and how we got here, and then the, uh, the remainder of the morning we'll talk about, okay, what happens next, if you will. Um, where we are is we have a 13 budget, and last time we got together we were still under a continuing resolution. So we have a 13 budget, uh, uh, but that budget wasn't passed until after sequester cuts were levied, and as, as uh, Kim Wincup pointed out, the implementation of that thir those 13 cuts, that $41 billion, is still being sorted out. Um, it, the, the bill that we got, H.R. 933, did appropriate funds at the sequestered level to cover DOD, 
it fixed some of the problems caused by the CR in terms of disconnects between investment accounts and, and O&M accounts. Um, it provided some flexibility to DOD. There's still a huge shortfall in overseas contingency operations, uh, the low end seven or eight billion dollars and at the high end 11 or 12 billion dollars. And that's in 13. That's not next year's shortfall. Um, expectations are DOD has announced they plan to submit a reprogramming, but that's not up there yet, so we don't know what's in it. And, and uh, we do know what its target is. It'll fix part of the OCO problem. But the biggest issue is the President's budget, which was submitted a week ago today, um, at a level well above what we call the post-sequestration BCA caps, or the final BCA caps, if you will. Um, and, and there is no overall problem or solution to address the fix for sequestration. The President's budget says we eliminate the need for the BCA caps through a combination of entitlement changes and additional revenue. Um, of course, that requires legislation in order for it to pass. And in addition, we have House and Senate budget resolutions that passed for the first time in living memory in advance of the President's budget having been submitted. Um, and, uh, and they are also, of course, not consistent with the post-sequestration caps. I don't need to remind you where we really are is we're in the middle of the fourth drawdown in the last 70 years. And the important point of this is that while it is a bit steeper than the last two, it's not nearly as deep. And the floor projected, even the right-hand side of this, even if the caps are complied with, is still $100 billion in real dollar terms above the floor in the post-Cold War drawdown, $100 billion above the floor in the post-Vietnam drawdown, $100 billion above the floor in real dollar terms of the post-Korea drawdown. The sequester I already talked about, but one of the most important things from the point of view of, of business is, in fact, outlays are well down. Um, investment outlays, report, as reported by the Treasury Department on the 10th of each month, Treasury reports uh, government outlays from the, from the previous month and the previous quarter. Uh, so procurement, RDT&E, and MILCON and DOD was down 3 percent in March, 8 percent for the quarter. That's year over year. And, uh, and when they add in, they have a, a uh, methodology where they add in some O&M, it's down even, even an additional percent, down to about 11 percent lower. So there's a lot less money being spent by DOD. This is reflective in the deferral process that's underway for sequestration. We're hearing a lot of stories about slow pay on invoices from companies across, uh, across the defense spectrum. Uh, and it isn't that invoices are being accepted and they're not paid. The best way the government, of course, can slow pay an invoice is not to accept the invoice. And so kick it back and question, and you have to go back and, and redo it again. We're even having instances where DCA is rejecting invoices, and the rationale being given is we don't have the funds, which, by the way, I think is a violation of the Anti-Deficiency Act, but, um, but so far nobody's been uh, indicted for, uh, for that. And, and, and as far as the, the, stay tuned. Um, as far as we know, furloughs are still planned in, in DOD. Uh, for all civilians, uh, the, a fairness principle being applied here, and the number currently out from the Secretary is uh, 14 days uh, beginning in late June. Um, I don't need to remind you how we got here, the Budget Control Act. The important thing to remember is that was not a spending cut bill. That was a debt ceiling bill. We bought with the Budget Control Act in August of 2011 essentially two years of increase in the debt ceiling. We paid for it with 10 years of cuts. All right. This is not a sustainable pattern over time. You can't continue to buy one year of debt ceiling increase for 10 more years of cuts, or else you run out of money before you run out of debt ceiling. So. And the reason, obviously, is because of the growth in spending uh, as a percent of GDP much higher than the uh, decline in revenue. Uh, the f important things about this chart, the red line, the top line, is, of course, red ink. That is the, the money being spent, total federal outlays. The, dotted black line is total federal receipts. Uh, you see that little surplus in the uh, late 90s. Of course, that's kind of a one-time deal, at least looks like it. And a very interesting point here, in 2008, total federal receipts exactly matched total federal outlays on entitlements, on mandatory spending. There was zero money to fund anything in the government in terms of discretionary. We're now a little above that. At the very far bottom, you see domestic discretionary and defense discretionary. That's the kind of green line and the dark blue line there. They've been essentially around 3.5 to 4.5 to 5 percent of GDP 
uh, since essentially the end of the Cold War and are staying about there. And at the very bottom, net interest on the debt, of course, we all know that's artificially low because right now interest rates are extremely low, about 2.1 percent for 10-year T-bills. Uh, with an inflation rate of 2 percent, people are essentially paying us to hold their money for them. The ability to sustain that over the next couple decades is, is likely to be uh, a, bit, a bit slim, if you will. Um, the President's budget, and this is really the right-hand side of this chart, is a critical piece. The base budget, that is non-OCO, because we don't have projections for OCO beyond 14, um, shows three, three levels there. The purple at the top is the uh, money that was cut out from the first BCA cut two years ago. That was the $487 billion that DOD lost in, in FY11 through 21. The green is the excess of the budget submitted over the caps, and the blue or periwinkle at the bottom, I actually don't know my colors well enough to know if that's periwinkle or not, uh, but I like the word. The periwinkle at the bottom uh, is what would be in the base budget if the caps were complied with. That's about a $300 billion difference over this fit-up. And, uh, and that's the real issue that we face today. So the budget was submitted. It's actually a very balanced budget in a different sense. One-third is for investment. One-third is for military personnel. One-third is for O&M. And uh, uh, doesn't have any sequester cuts in it. But the Secretary said in his public statements when the budget was released that that's what his Strategic Choices Review is doing, is preparing for what if we have to comply with the caps. The terms of reference for that study don't say that, but the Secretary did say that out loud. There are $34 billion in efficiencies. This is round, I don't remember how many rounds of efficiencies we've now had, uh, and that's mostly taking civilians out of the workforce, about 50,000 over, uh, over a five-year period. And of course, there are some terminations and some restructurings, but uh, in an unusual stroke for, for defense budgeting, there have been very little attention paid to that. In many ways, this 14 budget is the 13 budget that was proposed, not enacted, just uh, with the 14 instead of a 13 when we go forward there. So let me stop there and turn the floor to Martin. So this is what's up on the Hill now. Now what happens? Uh, let me just start quickly by uh, reviewing a little bit about 13. David um, mentioned most of this already, but I think there's some assumption that the reprogramming will largely cover uh, most of the OCO shortfalls um, in term that are due to excess lower or higher than expected projections <clears throat> for expenditures for OCO. Um, what remains to be seen is as the readiness crisis caused by sequester deepens, um, I, th I think there will be increasing pressure from some uh, to on the department to submit a another supplemental of some sort. And uh, I don't think there's a clear partisan um, break out on how that will be received. Obviously, I think some Democrats will be highly resistant to anything that fixes sequester for DOD and doesn't for others. Um, there'll be any, uh, there'll be some resistance potentially from Tea Partiers to um, undoing any of the cuts that we've uh, already enacted. So, uh, again, unclear how that would fare, unclear if OMB would um, actually support such a submission. Um, and so, I th but I just think that the tenor in, of that debate will heighten as we go forward and, and again, as readiness challenges become more and more apparent. Um, to get to 14, um, where's the, how do I put that there? Um, the good news in, in the dis unreality of all of this may be um, that it's, it's the easiest in 14. Um, the sh the top blue line is the original BCA caps, uh, which, uh, which is also the same numbers as in the House budget resolution. Uh, the Senate budget resolution is slightly lower than that. Um, and the budget request is, is in between those two, um, the bottom blue, periish, winkleish color um, is, the, is the caps with the cuts. Um, but as this points out, again, if there's good news in this, uh, lack of reality that we're engaged in, all the House, Senate, uh, and, and President's budget requests are all uh, at the $552 billion level for 050 accounts. So um, they're all starting at the same point of disreality, unreality, um, which in theory makes it somewhat easier. Um, I think the authorizers are expecting to mark to the $552 billion level um, and 
I, I, it remains to be seen what happens if and when there's some grand bargain um, about how that gets addressed subsequently. Um, but it, I, I do think, obviously, the challenge, therefore, will be where do they make cuts to redress some things that they're not happy with. Uh, there's some indications already of where that might happen. Um, the SASC, I think, today is releasing their report on overseas basing costs. Um, Senator Levin has already made comments about how he's not happy with uh, the percentage, the declining percentage of uh, burden sharing costs that are being borne by some of our partners. And so I think at least um, to some degree for symbolic purposes at a minimum, there may be some cuts to U.S. Uh, support for overseas bases to increase pressure on some of our partners and allies. Um, I, given the, what the Senate did last year on civilian personnel reductions, uh, this, this budget doesn't fully get to the level of cuts that they approved last year. So I think, again, there has been already, again, some indication that um, some members want additional CIVPERS cuts. So those also may be a source uh, for trying to buy back other things. Um, I think there'll be the usual push for cutting things like non-defense, things that are concerned conceived of as non-defense, you know, breast cancer research and those kinds of things. Um, and then uh, it's kind of good news about BRAC. There's, um, I think, about $500 billion or million dollars for BRAC. They can reallocate that to other um, higher priority MILCON projects. I don't think that'll uh, end up moving out of MILCON in all likelihood, but it does mean some other things might get bought with that in the presumption that I've just gotten pretty roundly um, rejected by everybody involved, so uh, I don't think that money is going to stay where it is. Uh, what kinds of things might they want to buy back? Um, I think there's some, clearly, uh, the department's proposals on TRICARE increases, fee increases, and, um, and potentially the military personnel uh, pay raise may be some, one place that it would go back into, um, and then, you know, remains to be seen on everybody else will have their individual um, things that they'll, they'll advocate for. But, so I think that's sort of how things look right now from the authorizer perspective. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, good morning, everyone. It's uh, good to be with you. Uh, my, and my piece of the puzzle this morning is to talk a little bit about appropriations. Uh, I will try to spare the invective to discuss the depression and the irritation because I want to prevent all of you from rushing out into traffic at around 10.15 and saying this is too much. Uh, it's really not that bad, and I'll tell you why. Um, if you said to me, Jim, what do you think the top-line defense base number will be for fiscal 14? Based on the early numbers that have been put on the street, I can probably give you a pretty good ballpark. And it's comfortable for me to say, oh, let's pick a number, let's pick 527. It's the Obama budget number. It's the House budget number. It's close to the Senate budget number. It's where all the numbers can be put into a category and added to, and you can come there. It, it discards the sequester, which I, we'll talk about in a moment. But it's a, a fairly reasonable round number. Uh, and from an appropriations perspective, and I, I don't want you to think we don't care about policy at all. That's not true for us policy's numbers, as you know. But um, if, you're given, if you give the appropriators a number, their track record and their history has been to try to make the number fit. There's a certain square peg round hole about the process, but you can nick the holes and change things around a little bit, and somehow, some way, the key element is to give the defense appropriators a base number and say, here, go write a bill. And I, I expect them to do that. I expect them to, I expect that uh, at some point in time in about a month, maybe a little after, you will see the Appropriations Committee in the House, and then shortly afterward in the Senate, You'll see the Senate committee roll out a set of 302B numbers, which parse all of the numbers, as you know, <coughs> off to the various uh, 12 subcommittees. The problem we face this year, and I don't want to too, go too far off this track because this is about defense, but defense does not exist in a vacuum. There's something else out there called non-defense. 
And if we're going to worry about defense, we have to worry about non-defense too. And if you look at, David mentioned that this year for the first time in the history of the Republic, the Congress decided to put a budget on the street before the President did. I'm not faulting the President. The President's budget was delayed because the Congress couldn't do last year's work, and that's a fact we have to own up to. But because the Congress has budget resolution numbers on the street, they are very instructive. And I'm, those of you who know me know that I'm as defensive of appropriators as I am critical of budgeteers, and I'm going to show you why. The difference between the number that Chair, Chairwoman Mikulski in the Senate has to parse out to her subcommittees and the number that Chairman Rogers has to parse out to his subcommittees is almost $100 billion. <coughs> now, folks, I would ask you to take a deep breath and say to yourselves, do you see any circumstance in the United States government where you could have a House committee and a Senate committee come to closure $100 billion apart? And the answer is, of course, not. To make matters worse in the House, and again, I'm pushing sequester off because I'm not trying to depress you, but I'll, I'll get to it. Setting sequester aside for a moment, we had the, origin, the, the, the initial complication of while the House budget set a number for defense that everyone can live with, may not like it, but we can live with it, the number for non-defense in an attempt to bake the sequester into their calculations is so low. It's, indeed, it is even lower than the sequester number. 974 would be the total BA number for sequester, 966 for the fiscal 14 House budget. Now that's, folks, that's not even a number. That's a number you'd write on a piece of paper, and I think the first thing I'd do is fold that piece of paper up and throw it in the trash can. What it is is what the House uh, uh, budgeteers believe is a starting point that would lead them into a discussion with their, center parts, their Senate counterparts about where to go to settle the discretionary number. Now, to bake the sequester into non-defense and to come and address the following year defense budget and pretend there's no sequester, to me, you know, it makes some political sense, I guess, if you believe that it's defense and nothing else in the world. Uh, but it doesn't make a great deal of sense in terms of getting anything, anything done. And, and just to show you how bad this is, there was an, uh, an allusion to it the other day in a very excellent piece in the Wall Street Journal. The discretionary number in the House budget is lower than the number we have for these discretionary programs pre-9-11. Now, as we have been so vividly reminded, the world has changed, and it has changed uh, not for the better. So we spend a lot of time now trying to figure out how we meet all the nation's security commitments, how we do them in a budgetary responsible way, but at the same time recognizing that there are a number of wars in this country, war on terror, war on poverty, war on disease, a bunch of wars that we have to fight. So unless that non-defense discretionary number is brought up, we're not going to make any progress this year. David alluded again to the fact that the House, or the Congress has, has brought out its own budgets. It's interesting to me, last year in this town, we all lamented the fact that process was broken. Not a day goes by in my world, somebody says, oh, process is broken. Well, that's true, process is broken. So what have we tried to do this year in this new Congress is, We've tried to do process first and substance second. We now have all of these things in place, but we still sit here wondering aloud what the substance and the policy will be behind a process that we have arbitrarily put in place to address these issues. At some point in time, the policy and the numbers and the program numbers have got to catch up with the process. And that is kind of tragically where we are this year. I do expect because Appropriators have a tendency to be very process driven. Uh, I mean, you know, I, if, I, if, I write a, if I write a bill in subcommittee on Monday, I got to have that bill in a full committee on Thursday. I got to be in a rules committee the following Monday. I got to be on the floor the following Tuesday. I've got all these templates I've got to meet, and they will do that this year. Call up there now and ask them how they're doing. They say, fine. We're okay. 
Got a lot of problems. Got to figure things out. Got to round things off. Got to create new pots. Got to create new holes. Got to jump up and down. But we'll, we'll get there. That's because uh, you always put the optimistic face on to the public. But the reality of life is the one thing that well, there are two things really that are hurting appropriations desperately. One is sequestration. Sorry, I couldn't avoid ultimately getting to it. The first is sequestration, and, and of course the second thing is is we desperately, deeply need, and it's not just the appropriators that need it, it's the country that needs it, and that's a new budget deal to give this country uh, a path to some uh, economic and, and, and budget stability. For me, the sequestration is what you do when you don't want to have an appropriations committee. Appropriators are supposed to, by, con by constitutional fiat, they're supposed to eliminate spending. Or they're supposed to control spending. They're supposed to eliminate waste. They're supposed to make investments. They're supposed to prioritize spending. They're supposed to run the government. They're supposed to provide the resources government, this government needs to function. The sequestration simply says, no, we're not going to do any of those things. We're going to cut everybody's head off just a piece at a time. First, we'll cut everyone's ear off. Then we'll cut everybody's nose off. If, if that's the way you want to run the government, it's the worst way possible to run the government. And I, I think you will all agree with me that uh, it's quite remarkable in this town that last year I couldn't find a politician anywhere who said, oh, this sequester is terrible. We've got to fix the sequester. The sequester will never happen. Do you think it'll ever happen? No, never, never happened in the world. Advised everybody I knew it couldn't possibly happen. Guess what? It happened. It happened, I thought, for two reasons. And they were both bad reasons, but it happened anyway. Sometimes the worst of reasons is the only reason. It happened because the Republicans believed at the end of the day it was the only leverage they had on a Democratic administration to get them to come to the table and talk about mandatory spending cuts. It happened because the Democratic Party members believed that by cutting defense, they would get the Republicans to scream uncle loud enough and long enough that the Republicans would come to the table and want to talk about taxes, revenues, and uh, long-term budget sustainability. Guess what? Everybody was wrong. None of those things happened. They haven't happened as we sit here today. And despite the fact that, um, let me take one last shot at the Budget Committee, and then I'm going to move on. Um, it, 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 despite the fact that uh, I, was, I was amused earlier in this year when the House Budget Committee flaunting the uh, 27th Amendments to the Constitution on congressional pay said either you write a budget or will cut your pay. The Constitution is pretty clear on this subject, by the way, if you want to read it, it's the 27th Amendment. Having said that now, both, part, both houses aggressively moved to write budgets and now we can't even get a conference con committee convened because the houses, neither house, especially the House, wants to make the motion to go to conference. So at some point in time, the appropriators are going to have to live with a deemed number. The number will be deemed 100, as I say, almost 100 billion lower in non-defense in the House than it is in the Senate. They will try to produce bills. The fate of these bills is to be determined. Defense will probably be the easiest of the lot, but you can't just do defense and walk home because defense isn't everything. So at some point in time, this call it gridlock, if you will, it's kind of floating gridlock, will have to yield to a big deal. My own personal belief is, and uh, you know, we tried to get a big deal in 2011, that failed, so then we said, well, we, we're overshooting the target, we gotta look for something smaller. So we tried almost a year's worth of small deals, and guess what, they didn't work either. So now we're back trying to figure out whether or not we can do a big deal, and no community in this town needs a big deal more than the Defense Department, because for my friends, I will guarantee you if we cannot drive a big deal that cleans up our, our revenue code, that controls our entitlement spending, and that sets acceptable discretionary spending limits, what we will have in this country is we will nick and nibble defense year after weary year. And if you think the current instability and the current uncertainty is troublesome, then prepare for it over the foreseeable future because defense is too easy to get at. 65% of the discretionary budget, and when all else fails, what do you do? We go back and nick discretionary. I was intrigued by the Obama administration budget that says, well, we're going to take another $100 billion out of defense. We're going to cut it out in fiscal 17. Now, we haven't gotten through 14. We don't know what the numbers are for 13, and we fear that they're suspiciously like 12, but we're cutting $100 billion out in 17. Hey, make it $200 billion. Fine. Make it three. 
Okay, we're now on one year linear budgeting. Now I know why the authorizing committees always did one year authorizations. They're in the same boat we're in. Long range planning is something we do in the Pentagon and we're trying to do it in the State Department, but by God, long range planning in this Congress is about a day at a time. So and unless we can get ourselves into a big deal that lays out a path that people can buy into, we're going to have this problem in the foreseeable future. And we're going to have to live with it. And it's going to be bad for the country. It's going to be bad for everybody. And it's going to generate uh, a lot of concern on the part of everybody that, that, that for instance, uh, and let me be very specific with you, the biggest concern we had in the first quarter of the first quarter of calendar 13 was the fact that uh, we were operating off of fiscal year 12 numbers in the Defense Department and they were totally out of whack. We didn't have enough money to, to, to basically run the O&M accounts. Well, the Congress moved aggressively to do something about that and took some of the pressure off. They didn't take it all off. This is why you see the Air Force talking about reduced flying hours and you see everybody talking about lower contracts and lower obligations. It's not all off. It's still there. And it will stay there. And, and we will never really get the type of match that we need uh, matching money to programs because we're always living in the past. We're always, we're always looking at numbers that, that while we get new numbers, they're basically in old pots. And we have to get off of this backward path and into a forward path. So uh, l let me stop there. I've talked too long. But just to say that this uh, is a very uh, difficult time, I think, for anybody who lives and dies by numbers. I told David I didn't want to do charts because I was afraid that if I wrote a chart last week, by the time it got in here, somebody put a press release out in the Pentagon and make my chart useless. And I, st I still feel that way. So uh, I, I would just say to you all, uh, think big this year if this is about trying to produce a defense budget that is worthy of this country's global leadership because we have to do a lot of things, and it's not just to focus on the numbers in defense. Thank you. I suppose it would make it easier if people could actually hear me. I'm here to talk about the S word. <coughs> See, I can't even get it out without choking. The S word for strategy as opposed to sequester. Uh, I was asked to look at the strategic implications of the FY14 budget, and I scratched my head, and uh, first thing, Defense News helped me out with an editorial on Monday, when, as everybody else does, characterized the FY14 budget as unrealistic, but they also said it was a strategic blunder. Now, they're using strategy in a tactical sense here, in terms of, of managing of the Department of Defense, but there's no question that when you have people across the spectrum of opinion, like McKenzie and Gluna at the AEI and Gordon Adams at Stimson Center, all agreeing that this is a completely unrealistic budget in terms of the amount of revenue it's going to have, what it's going to be able to uh, save, what it's going to be able to afford to buy in terms of equipment, afford to buy in terms of force structure, and so on. So unrealism, you know, this is where Dr. Hamry started. It's where all of our panelists started about the lack of reality to the budget. So I decided to go back and take a look at sort of Hegel as a strategist. If you remember, he got into a lot of trouble initially for making the statement about bloated budget. The DOD has a bloated budget. People didn't pay attention to what else he said. He said, quote, our military has not really looked at themselves strategically, critically, in a long, long time. So he's saying we have to think more strategically about the military. Well, he also said, you know, on the first day he's defending his budget, sequestration is the law. It is not debatable for me. This is what is on the books now. I have to deal with that reality, and I have to manage and lead in that reality. Well, it may be on the books, but it wasn't in his budget, you know. And that's the thing, you know, it's just sitting there, the sequester, the 52 billion that's supposed to come off the top at the end of 58. So he did call for a strategic choices and management review, uh, known colloquially as a scammer, 
Uh, although Bob Hale says I don't call it that, but uh, um, as was mentioned by David, its goals were a little, uh, it was set up on 15 March. Uh, its goals were a little vague. It's to identify the choices that underlie our defense strategy, posture, and investment, including all past assumptions and systems. Uh, but then that's not the last thing he did. He also gave a speech on 3, no, 3 April at the National Defense University where he started to lay out uh, the way he was looking at strategy. It was actually, uh, I think it was probably presented in a bit of a dispiriting way. Um, Defense News again helped me out, flat delivery uh, in terms of the secretary. But he raised the right issues, you know, that we have to accept this new reality that it leads to fundamental change, a further prioritization of the use of our resources, he fully internalized something that we at CSIS, but increasingly throughout the policy community, have been emphasizing uh, for much of last year, and that is it is not just a top-line problem. It's not just fewer defense dollars. It is also the crowding out effect of internal cost growth, increasing costs of personnel, increasing costs of, uh, of medical, increasing costs of O&M, increasing costs of acquisition. It's leaving less and less room. Uh, most recent calculation of Todd Harrison at CSBA is, is that by 21, when the sequester cuts are over, the caps uh, that are in law are over, uh, the United States Department of Defense would be spending 86% of its budget on personnel and medical costs and O&M. Doesn't leave much for procurement, does it? Our estimates were a little higher than that. Uh, because uh, we were more pessimistic on the ability of the department to change in terms of the work that we've been doing at CSIS. So you start looking at the expectations for this strategic choices and management review, and Hagel himself makes it very clear that, let me find the right page for the quote, makes it very clear that everything's on the table with this, and his list of what's on the table is very comprehensive. Everything will be on the table during this review. Roles and missions, if there was ever a word that the Department of Defense was allergic to, it's roles and missions. Um, we've seen many failures uh, attempt to address roles and missions directly. Uh, planning is going to be on the table, business practices, force structure, personnel and compensation, acquisition and modernization investments, and how we operate and maintain readiness. We have no choice. The shortage of resources is going to drive it to us. Um, the statement is right, yet the rumors that come out of the department in terms of what's happening in the scammer, uh, I talked to one very experienced uh, uh, close Pentagon watcher uh, who's sitting at the table who said, uh, I hear there's an awful lot of working group committees. Well, that's a typical DOD, QDR kind of thing, is to create a proliferation of, uh, of working groups. Um, there are some people out acting as if it were cut drill. Uh, my feeling is I can only say two things certainly, with certainty about the SCMR. Very little strategy and very few choices will be made during that time. Um, but there's still this budgetary squeeze. Um, I agree with Jim. Uh, the United States is, the United States government is a situation where the vice uh, of mandatory entitlement spending, uh, if left to its current trends by 2036, we have no discretionary spending of any kind. The crowding out effect of mandatory. There has to be in order to put stability, not just in terms of what the government actually does, but stability in what the United States itself does abroad, because our strategy is unchanged. We're still the indispensable nation. We're still the country that if we withdraw, the vacuum will create instability and threats to our interests. That hasn't changed. Uh, and in fact, we're now going from a counterinsurgency-oriented Department of Defense to a full-spectrum defense. Full spectrum operations is the new buzzword from all of the services at this time. Um, 
not exactly sure how that computes. Indispensable nation, capable of full spectrum operations. And oh, by the way, your resources are dropping from the top down about 20% and hollowing out from the inside by about another 20% during that time. Not sure how you be an indispensable nation capable of full spectrum operations under those conditions. Uh, but we're in a situation, and I think, you know, to the President's credit, the FY14 budget request from the U.S. government perspective was, as Michael Linden at the Center for American Progress characterized it, a, quote, preemptive compromise budget. That's an interesting concept. $1.8 trillion. It had some revenue in it. It was balanced. It had some rev new revenues, about 600 that had additional cuts, some of them made up, some of them pushed beyond the fit, up, to be sure, in terms of defense. Um, but it did put some entitlement reforms, change CPI, some changes here, some changes there, on the table. Um, was that a strategic blunder or not? Uh, my feeling is, is that a deal of that kind is the only hope for the way forward it's hard to be real optimistic about hope in this uh, particular environment. But at some point, the crunch on discretionary spending, both defense and non-defense, will get so great that there has to be an overall bargain. Now, it could be a bargain that's achieved fitfully, because people tend to forget we've achieved either 2.5 trillion or 2.8 trillion, depending upon who's doing the counting, of debt reduction already. That's just sort of relieved the pressure a little bit to urgently move. We still have a long way to go. So from my perspective, you know, where the department is, and this, my last word on this is that uh, the Commandant, General Lamus, testified a couple of days ago. And he said something I never thought I'd see a uniform person say, much less a Marine say. And that is they're used to saluting smartly and say, we can do more with less. We can do more with less. Well, the Commandant didn't. He said, we're going to do less with less. Now, the truth of the matter is, we're actually going to do less with much less. But that is the beginning of acceptance of a reality, is that we are now in a position where we are going to do less with less. And people are going to have to learn how to say no, so that it makes clear what the opportunity costs are for a lack of realism, either at the grand strategy level about an indispensable nation with full spectrum operations and a department that is being starved and nibbled to death each month, as Jim talked about, each year, as Jim talked about, or at the Department of Defense level, because when you keep putting off the reality of having to make tough choices, it allows you to avoid tough choices. It allows you to not reform wasteful business practices. It allows you to duck roles and missions and division of labor between the services. Um, this lack of realism has to end because right now sequester is the law. And the only certainty here is the law will be applied unless it's changed. Thank you. Well, great start to a tough dialogue. Um, one of the interesting thing, audiences at CSIS always have enormously valuable perspectives, so we're looking forward to your questions. General Swartz, nice to see you, sir, and thank you for your service. Um, before we do that, I just have two, I have a question and a comment. First of all, I, speaking for the three authorizing committee uh, former staffers on the panel, <laughs> I, I do want to say that I'm used to hearing the world according to the Appropriations Committee. I had never heard the universe according to the Appropriations <laughs> Committee before, but always good to hear, Jim. Thank you. Yeah because sometimes we misunderstand the process. Um, I, do, I do want to ask the folks that have been in the building, the Pentagon, uh, and have helped build a budget. I, I, I frankly am a little perplexed as to how this SCMR is going to deal with both the President's budget and the, and the actuality he, that the Secretary said that they would anticipate the sequestration which is on the books. How, is that feasible? Can I just answer the first of those questions and not address the feasibility? I'll leave that to, to. 
I, I'll start by, by opining that one of the real advantages of this review, the SC review, I think some are, are calling it. I actually prefer skimmer because that's kind of what I expect it to do. Uh, there's just a skim a little bit off the top. But it has one enormous advantage. Um, when a Secretary of Defense comes in, as, as Secretary Hagel has done, in the middle of a dynamic which he neither created nor participated in, um, he needs a way to get up to speed really quickly. And I suspect that that's part of what this strategic review is going to do. It, it, and in fact, it, at one level, it, the only level at which it may really be strategic is in getting him to think uh, and, and be aware of, of what's going on. Because we sort of know what the choices are. There's not a lot of new choices are going to pop up here. Oh, that $50 billion, why didn't we think of that? I mean, it's a, that's not going to happen, right? Um, I think the other thing that it, it has, you know, since, since the Budget Control Act was passed, and you'll remember for the first basically 16 months under the BCA or 17 months, DOD was operating under a rule of don't even think about planning for this because it's not going to happen, right? And I think what you see now is a recognition, and obviously the services and every component at every level was doing some thinking and some scenario development. It's just that none of it was integrated across a common set of assumptions and, and principles and priorities. So what you may have, this is the second positive thing I can say about it, uh, Kim, is that you may now be at least moving towards a common set of understandings as to what it is we're supposed to be thinking about as we're looking at these potential reductions. That's about the best spin I can put on it. Um, as to its feasibility, um, I'll leave that to, to others to comment. Lauren, can I volunteer you for that one? Uh, well, I, I think I share David's views on uh, some uh, on the upsides, and it's hard to it's the first bit of optimism perhaps we've heard today. Um, I, I have to say I'm I'm pessimistic about the feasibility. Um, the department doesn't tend to uh, to really make strategic choices. I mean, I certainly observed over years and years that a lot, a lot, a lot of senior leader time is spent on decisions of $100 million or less. Um, so, and, and it's just extremely difficult for a bureaucracy that big to, to really deal with big choices. And, and while I think um, and, we, and we've talked a little bit about this before, that the Secretary um, certainly has an opportunity to bring some new thinking. He still does have the team that put where we are together on the table there. And so uh, you know, I also think it's just difficult to get that something that is was a negotiated solution of, with all the players still there to really uh, to, to sort of beat new approaches out of that is, is a challenge. So I'll, I'll kill that optimism a little bit. <laughs> Clark, you want to go first, Jim, or shall uh, I go first? I'll be brief. I, from my perspective, and I, I'm a great believer in reviews. We should do them all the time. But the issue for me is, is resources and how you expect the cleverest policy planners on Earth, I'll stipulate they're in the Pentagon, how the cleverest policy planners on earth can be confronted with a reduction of $42 billion in mid-fiscal year, and then a prospect of another $51 billion should nothing happen this year on the budget front. At some point in time, <coughs> I, I've always been impressed by a uh, spokesman of the Pentagon saying, well, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, and of course we're going to do it because, as Clark says, it's the law. But I, 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 I don't think you can have a successful review process without having a, predict a predictable flow of resources, even if the resources are lower if, at whatever level. But don't pull the plug or change the game halfway through the fiscal year. If you want to change the fiscal year, which I think is a brilliant idea, uh, you should do that. Uh, but let's and, and if we're going to cut Pentagon spending, let's agree to cut it, but let's agree to cut it in a, in, in a more planning, effective, thoughtful way after a whole bunch of consultations, as opposed to say, uh, well, we hit you 40 this year, we're going to hit you 50 next year. I was stricken last week by the words of Chairman Buck McKeon, who said he was concerned that he didn't think people were taking this second follow-on sequester seriously enough, and I think he's right. 
I think people tend to think, oh, this happened. Well, first, they didn't think it was going to happen. Then when it happens, oh, we'll get through this thing. Uh, it's hard to focus on the next one if we're still living with the last one. So I, I, would, I would hope that a review, whenever taken on, is done with adequate resources, even if they're less. Don't. It, it's, it's so wrong to take away big chunks in the middle of a fiscal year. Give somebody an opportunity to do some planning. Uh, I agree with David that, in part, this strategic choices and management review is like what Rumsfeld did when he first came in. And he had a top-to-bottom top to bottom strategy review, is what he called it. And for a while, you know, for several months, there was a lot of speculation that that was going to replace the QDR process. But it was Rumsfeld bringing his own approach to it. This is Hagel bringing his approach to it. He wants, in a sense, a time out to do a process that he controls rather than one that he senses everybody else in the building is fully familiar with and might want to do. So this is partly about Rumsfeld getting more strategic. I mean, Hagel getting more strategic. Um, Bob Hale, as he usually does, was a little bit indiscreet in his testimony um, and indicated that they were looking at alternative fiscal futures, which meant that they were bounding it with full sequester because a couple of people, including Hale, indicated we're looking at full sequester, but they're also looking at an upward level, which is probably the FY14 request, which is no sequester. And somebody said we're going to look at the Senate number as well which was sort of in between the two of them. So they're looking at some alternative fiscal futures. And I think that the key thing is going to be, like Jim talked about, a deemed number. They're going to say, at what point does the 2012 defense strategic guidance, the current strategy guidance, at what point as you go down the fiscal ladder is the strategy broken and we have to think about a new strategy? And I think, if I were to make a guess, they're going to say, if we go FY14 and have to take another $52 billion off it, they're going to say strategy's broken, and we have to do a new strategy that fits the sequester during that time. Well, I'm going to use a time-honored Washington technique and answer my own question in that <laughs> I don't think they'll do it. I think it, actually, I think it should be done just for the starkness of it, not only for 14, but for the out years where the sequester hits. And, but, but I think it'll be too hard, for one thing, and, and actually I don't see any way to do it by May 30th, given the time frame that, that uh, it's involved in the significance of the issues. Okay. We are now looking for uh, questions from the, let me just go through the, the, the ground rules again. Uh, hold up your hand. I'll recognize you. The folks will bring you a microphone, and then state your name and affiliation, and then uh, We'll give the, the really tough questions to Maren, and, and the others will uh, enjoy that. <laughs> okay, who would There's like no to ask? To pass it to. That's right. Ray? Uh, Ray Dubois, CSIS. All of you, would, it would appear that all of you, uh, uh, to use Clark's, uh, I thought, appropriate uh, comment, there will be very little choices made in the Strategic Choices and Management Review. I mean, it seems to me that Secretary Hagel has put himself way out on a limb. I mean, he's exposing himself if nothing or very little comes out of that review with respect to uh, major building, strategic building blocks, et cetera. I mean, he's personally and professionally at risk. And I find that very disturbing that he would have put himself in such a position if, in point of fact, very little choices are the outcome of the process. Can, can I put a different spin on that, though? Um, what, let me go back to the speech, the NDU speech that you cited, Clark, the, the April 3rd speech, where he said everything is on the table. Um, and let me draw from Jim Dyer's comments that, you know, we should probably expect that what we've seen over the last year or two is what we're going to see next year and the year after that. The likelihood of achieving nirvana here, reaching, I like big deal better than grand bargain, because big deal. But, um, but it is, in fact, 
you know, not likely that the votes are going to be there in the next three or four months to do this. So we may have to become accustomed to this chaos. What Secretary Hagel is beginning to do here, and I'm going to, I'm going to cite the, the report that, uh, that Kim mentioned, that, uh, that Clark Murdoch and, and, uh, and Ryan Crotty just put out. We had an event on this, and it's, it's the one that basically shows, sure, you can't see this chart, but it basically says by 2021, the internal cost growth in O&M and the internal cost growth in military pay and benefits, including the O&M uh, funded parts of health care, will essentially drive out investments, right? And you look at the dynamic that's going on to pay for the sequester. Investments are going to be the one that, I mean, sequester is being paid for by same cuts everywhere. But that will then be offset by the supplemental and the reprogramming, which will shift money from investment accounts into to cover the shortfalls for O&M, mil, military pay obviously exempt from sequester. Left to its own devices, the department will continue squeezing investment in order to pay for O&M and military personnel. What Secretary Hegel has done, and it may not be the most elegant way of doing it, but I think what he's done is saying, I want to put those things back on the table. I don't want investment to pay for everything for the next 10 years. We need to figure out a way so that everybody's paying a piece of it here. That is, you know, and it may not be elegant, it may not be artful in the way it's been described, it may not even be his intent. I may be extrapolating far more than is intended here. But at least the potential is being opened for wrestling with that kind of question. So he may be out on a limb, but I think it's the right limb on which he should be out. I, trying to pick my participle, which I dangle there carefully. But I mean, I think it's the right limb. I agree it's the right limb. But I look at two previous examples. Um, Secretary Rumsfeld, again, came in, top to bottom, strategy review. He was routed during that time. Then he fell back into a QDR, goes out in August to meet with the president. The president's clearly unhappy with him. People were making book that he was the first cabinet officer to be driven out because a Republican administration comes in and the department is in an uproar and Congress is in an uproar and he didn't get the money he thought he was going to get out of OMB to raise the defense budget and people were making book that he was on his way out and then 9-11 occurred and it saved his job. Did a lot of things but it saved Rumsfeld's job during that time because Rumsfeld did have big ideas and failed to deliver on them and I'm afraid and he said many of the right things. The speech he gave the day before 9-11 inside the department was an excellent speech in terms of what needed to be addressed in terms of roles and missions and the kinds of issues that were out there. Gates is the other model of somebody who said, oh, I'm just here to fix a rock, rock, rock. That's my job. Maybe a little Afghanistan in the end. And then turned out to be a very strong Secretary of Defense in terms of his willingness to make tough decisions. And in April of 2009, cut out $300 billion plus worth of poorly functioning programs during that time. But Bob Gates never said he was going to change the world and do all this, do all that. He just went about his job and did things. And so um, if there's anything, I think that the history of past Secretary of Defenses, and I remember I worked directly for one who was probably one of the worst of the Secretary of Defenses. Certainly one of the shortest lived uh, during that time. Shows you what happens when an authorizer takes over the Pentagon. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it's a reminder that you don't go out on any limb, even if it's the right limb. Your actions always speak louder than your words. And I wish he hadn't gone as far out as he did. I do think that there are a few off ramps on the limb. I mean, um, some people have said that the review is really intended to identify the assumptions that will inform the QDR. And so, you know, again, I think, um, and the other big off-ramp in my mind is if it's in fact an excursion to examine different budget options and you don't know what the budget option, you know, you don't have a number uh, at the end of the day, well, then there are, it's all just theoretical anyway. So you, there's nothing that you have to deliver on until Congress gives you a number. So um, I think I'm, I'm I'm not sure as, as much of a limb as it might at first appear. George Nicholson with Stratcorp. You alluded to the QDR, and you've seen in the last couple of months the new congressionally directed QDR oversight commission has been put together. Looking at the members of that commission, uh, do you think that we're just still looking at old think or they're going to be able to actually provide any substantive inputs into the process? 
Clark, you're the, um, but let me just start by saying that they're not supposed to provide inputs. You know, they're supposed to review the end product. Um, I do think there's some couple, there's a few uh, folks on there that are not what I would consider old think kind of folks. Um, so, but again, they had a, a pretty um, strong and uh, challenging review of the last QDR um, to little or no effect, it would be my assessment. So um, I'm not sure how much that matters. And, and there was a lot of discussion after the last QDR and after the last independent review panel that there would be changes to the QDR process and, and not much of that has actually happened. So I'm not sure how much it matters. Thank you. I'll ask that question again. Um, we all look at this from the Washington standpoint, uh, but David, your chart suggested that there's another constituency out there that's important, and it's the program managers and the people that are actually running programs who are watching all this and trying to be responsible to do what they think is right. And your outlays suggest that potentially, and I'd, I'd be interested in your thought on this, whether last year they moved on their own and began to husband resources in anticipation of sequestration. And, and what's your thought, if that seems to be the case, how do you think they act this year where with a similar circumstance of sequestration sitting out there, contrary, somewhat different than the President's budget? I, I think that's a, boy, that's a complicated uh, uh, posture to look at. Um, tracking the data is, is useful. Uh, DOD has its own internal obligation data that gets reported to the comptroller. They are not consistent with the Treasury Department reported data that come out publicly, which is very intriguing to me. Um, I, I've made a career out of taking advantage of data discrepancies uh, in order to uh, drive a decision the way you want it to go because, uh, as you know, we spend a lot of time inside the government arguing over whose numbers are right rather than what it is we ought to do. But in this case, I think the Treasury Department data are pretty good, and they do show uh, that in the fourth quarter of last calendar year, notwithstanding the guidance from DOD that said spend normally, uh, that in fact there was a dramatic reduction in outlays, both uh, DOD investment outlays and across the entire federal government. Um, I think if you talk to individual programs and program managers and to the companies that are in the, under the prime contractors for those programs, you will see a tremendous tendency of that. The downstream effect of this, though, is, is uh, a complicating factor we haven't talked about here this morning. If, in fact, for your investment cuts, for your O&M and RDT&E cuts for sequestration, you solve those cuts not by terminating a program, because you can't terminate 9% of a program or 13% of a program, uh, but by deferring and delaying, then you've basically shoved those requirements into the next fiscal year, into fiscal year 14. There's no room in that 14 budget for those, that additional $20 billion, which you've just shoved out to there. Um, and in fact, we just said that budget's $50 billion above the cap. So it's really $70 billion above the cap because you've just shoved $20 billion worth of requirements into it uh, from 13. Um, and if you take Clark's cost growth numbers, it's actually about 73 or 74% above the cap, uh, or 73 or $74 billion, because you've got the unanticipated and unbudgeted for cost growth in MILPERS and, uh, and O&M there. So I, I think, actually, Kim, the, the situation is more dire uh, th than it looks. And uh, um, how does an individual program manager deal with it in that circumstances? He can't really change requirements, right? He can't undo his contract. In fact, a perfect example of that is, is the struggle the Air Force is having with the KC-46 tanker. Fixed price development contract, um, multi-year long-term fixed price development contract, in and into with eyes wide open by all parties. Uh, the CR threatened to force the Air Force to break that contract because it did not have the funding necessary in order to do it. Um, the, the appropriations bill fixes that, so I think the Air Force said uh, that their 14 budget and their 13 sequestration do not require them to break the contract. But the minute you open up a fixed price development contract for an adjustment for dollars, you're opening it up for everything else as well. And that, so that's just one example. Almost every contract is in that same circumstance. I think it's a very tough world for a program manager uh, to be in, and buying time until your successor arrives may be your best strategy. Uh, Kim, could I just add a Please. footnote to that? 
uh, in the first quarter of what on paper was FY13, actually it was FY12 continued, DOD was spending uh, well above its BCA cap. And no one told DOD to stop. Everyone basically said uh, the, the assumption was, oh, this is going to get fixed. So there were two sequesters out there. There was the threat of the big sequester, and there was a smaller sequester out there that was going to be necessitated to get D, uh, DOD down to its BCA cap. And my own experience is they were putting contracts on the street in December, but uh, they were getting sluggish because it was this fear of the secondary cap that was going to force their spending levels lower. And this was necessitated by the confusion that was created in the 2011 Act about national security funding as opposed to defense funding just created this mismatch. And it was, uh, it was something that DOD uh, had on its, its radar. And while it was not under any guidance to slow spending, they knew that if they didn't, they were going to have to do some things into the second quarter of what would have been FY13. So that was out there. Uh, Curtis Buzzard, military fellow here at CSIS. I have a question on jointness uh, coming out of this budget. As you look, as a guy that, you know, redeployed recently from Afghanistan, we are, op, you know, probably operating at the optimal level of jointness right now <clears throat> and soft conventional integration. And as these budget trade-off decisions are made really without priorities, it seems, to a large degree, there's a potential that it really has a very negative effect on jointness. And we go back to our corners and look to look for more service-specific capability responses to joint capabilities. I'd be curious what your thoughts are on how the Secretary can in still encourage that within this budget cycle. For instance, if you look at air-sea battle and really how that forces the Navy and Air Force to work together, should there be something looking at innovative ground force combinations and greater interdependence rather than what I think is I'm seeing the opposite of that uh, potentially occurring? There's nothing, <clears throat> before the last 10 years, people used to talk about the budgetary wars being the Pentagon's real wars. Well, we've been fighting a lot of real wars since then, so people no longer make that joke. But there's no question that when there's a competition for scarce resources, it's hard for people to sing kumbaya and come together when people are trying to keep enough resources for the rice bowls within each respective institution. So I think that the effect of resource scarcity uh, is to exacerbate competition. But I also think it depends on how sharp the resource scarcity is to whether you get to the point where you really do think anew. Uh, I would take the UK system as some indication of what can happen when really tight resource requirements, resource constraints tighten in. For example, we now have acquisition processes in all the services and an OSD. They mean should be one or the other. You don't need them in both places. Instead, what we have is an awful lot of gridlock in acquisition because there's so many players involved. Well, in the British system, you have a defense procurement agency that issues, that's run by civilians, and issues equipment to the military. They went there because they couldn't afford not to go there. They have a joint requirements process. The services don't generate requirements. They have a joint requirements generation process in the UK. Um, it's only the combatant commands who have operational requirements. Services shouldn't have any requirements generation. But that's not true during that time. So uh, one thing that can happen from resource scarcity, if it's severe enough, you can get fundamental changes in how you do things. But I would argue that the near-term effect is always to exacerbate conflict, to get in the way of jointness uh, in the way that you talk about it. And since uh, uh, a predominant this nation as a, as a nation is war-weary and recession-weary, uh, um, this will be a time when this is going to be an unending pressure because the mandatory entitlements you know, that constantly put the pressure on discretionary spending will increase. So it's, a, 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 it's going to be a long, drawn-out process, but I think it's going to one that will eventually result in fundamental change. Other questions?
That's Jim Woodbridge with SAIC. This is, uh, I guess, more for, for Jim Dyer being a kind of partial to the appropriations process myself. But so do you do you think, when talking about process, do you think that uh, Mikulski and Rogers will push forward this year to get back to regular order and just mark, uh, you know, ignore the sequester number and mark to what the president, uh, you know, use that uh, number? Uh, one of the, 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 the burden is heaviest on Rogers. Uh, because he's going to deal with a deeming resolution that will not let him go forward with very many bills. You can write legislation. The question is, can you pass it? And the 302B process has always been a pro an internal process up there where the chairman has looked at his subcommittees and said, what, how much money do you need to get a bill through the House? And last year, you'll recall that they got five bills signed into law and seven were simple day changes. To the best of my knowledge, that's the first time that's ever happened uh, in the history of the Republic. It's a terrible trend because you, you really, uh, once you start, and we talked about it earlier, once you start living with baselines that are a year or two back, you just never really catch up. I think the trick for Rogers will be uh, can he massage his allocations to move as many bills as he can till he gets some kind of guidance on a big deal, which I believe will revise the discretionary number, the discretionaries again. Remember, I think Clark alluded to the savings we've gotten so far, okay? In discretionary spending, you've got $1.2 trillion worth of savings, and you got them in the most painless way possible. You took the CBO adjusted baseline from March of that year, 2011, and you ran it out 10 years, and then you dropped it by a trillion two, you didn't feel a thing, okay? Uh, it, they're real cuts, but you didn't feel it. But that's how you got that one, two. And ironically, we've been violating that thing ever since we got it. It was the only thing we've agreed on in three years, and everybody around says, well, we got to change that. They changed the number as late as, uh, as uh, 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 January of this year in the uh, McConnell-Biden agreement. But I think the trick becomes at a certain point in time how Rogers moves his numbers to a point where he, he, wa he will want to report bills, all, he want to get something out of his committee. And remember, he can go to any number he wants then. Where the budget points of order fall in line are when he gets to the floor. And I think his goal will be, and I haven't discussed it with him, but I think his goal will be, let me produce 12 bills in committee. I'll produce them at whatever level I think I need to get them through the House. But then if points of order must fall against them, they would fall when he has to put them on the floor. In the meantime, he's hoping for a big deal but if he sticks close to the strip, script, he should be in a defense number that is fairly close to what will be the standard accepted number, which would be around 527 or so. I would add one more thing. The House tends to look at 302 Bs different than the Senate. The House tends to plus up defense. The Senate takes it down a little bit. The Senate tends to spread the butter like butter over toast evenly among some of the other mid-level subcommittees. The toughest is labor age because it's traditionally not a bill that the Republicans get very excited about, but it's very important uh, to Senate Democrats. So you have two different philosophies in play, but the issue will be how many bills can you get out of committee and then see what happens. It's easier to write a continuing resolution if you've got levels that you have put in play come September 15 because they're out of committee and just write the committee level. But could I add one thing to that, please? Jim Woodbridge, even if we return to regular order, even if they pass, and of course the, the 050 is not necessarily the 302B allocations for the, for the appropriations committees, until and unless the caps are changed. Even if you pass a bill, you'll be fine in October, you'll be fine in November, you'll be fine in December. You can spend away at the level appropriated, but on January 1st, you have another sequester, and it brings you back down to the caps all over again. And so regular order only works until, in fact, you drive off the cliff and then gravity takes over. <laughs> well, Jim, let me just throw in one other one other point. I think Jim Jim Dyer had it right, but but there is in addition to the sequestration, there's a there's an, another problem out there. If you if if you're a committee chairman, report a bill that's inconsistent with the budget resolution and allocation. Not only is there a budget point of order potential, but there's also a cross across the board amendment which you don't like to look at because the House or the Senate has already voted at a, at a level and they may well offer an across the board amendment. It's a, it's a huge detriment to, to deviate too far from, from where the budget resolution was. We should have a, a, uh, 
uh, CSIS event that explains exactly how a point of order is raised and dispensed with on the floor. It would be a very well attended sure event, I'm quite sure. <laughs> Pastor Howes, British Defence Attaché. I just wanted to add a footnote to Mr. Murdoch's comment and perhaps an observation from my colleague who's now left on the subject of jointry. As an outsider with little understanding of the American process that you've described in such elegant detail, I am struck by, and perhaps predictably, by how mesmerized you are by the short term. Um, and, uh, you know, it is a Byzantine thing that you've sought to, to, um, to articulate. The, the diagrams that you helpfully provided show, though, that there is an, there is an inexorable and unavoidable long-term issue that you have. And it is more, it seems to me, the, the, the resolution of it, and I'm simply extrapolating my own impoverished nation's experience. Um, uh, it, we usually uh, experience things after America. You know, something happens here, whether it's obesity or something else, and five years later, we're fat in Europe. Um, <laughs> This is an unusual experience to be ahead of you um, in this painful experience. And it's the cultural shift which was pointed to. And the idea, Marin's point about, well, delaying, uh, you can buy time. You can't buy time. You throw things over the fence. The, the euphemism for this de-scope, delay, defer um, is to, you know, you, you gerrymander the problem and then you get further cost growth. And we ended up with this completely unsustainable, you will all be aware of it as defense analysts, equipment, bow wave, which was just submerging us. And we were living in a sort of, in a, in a strange parallel universe where we were kidding ourselves we could afford the equipment program that we had. So we have now balanced the budget um, in inverted commas, and it was probably in real, realistic terms balanced the day that it was balanced. Um, and now we have a whiteboard so-called, the euphemism, which is that the chiefs sit down. And at the end of the day, your point, ma'am, that um, an awful lot of senior leadership time is spent deliberating in your culture over uh, decisions for less than 100 million. Somehow or other, and this is really easy to say and so hard to achieve, that, that the sense of sitting down and trying to determine what is needed for uh, America's defense and working out what your margin is when all those non-discretionary payments are made and then collectively on a whiteboard saying what will remain seems to be working for us now. Now, that sounds sort of wildly simplistic set against the mechanisms that you've just described and doesn't allow for the complicated challenges that you have with Congress currently and the politics which are clearly hugely complicating and the fact that programs are distributed like Osprey over 50 different states and, and, and. But the cultural shift and my sense, the duplication of quite a lot of the programs seems to me the elephant in the room and something which we, through an unbelievable amount of bloodletting over 15 years, have finally grasped. And somehow or other, it's the cultural shift that seems to me the fundamental thing. Since I <clears throat> provoked your question, I'd like to respond to the question. Um, I agree with you completely, but this is where there's a fundamental difference in our processes. I take you back to a comment that Jim made earlier in the day that there is no long-range planning in the Congress. Congress thinks a day ahead at that time. Uh, I was at an earlier stage when I was more optimistic about the cause of defense reform went over to London and spent time trying to understand how the British government, the British Ministry of Defense was organized and do it. This was several years ago. And he, the three-star general is explained to this, explained to this, says, but, but this doesn't have anything to do with you. I mean, this doesn't apply to you. You have a Congress. I don't know how you get anything done with a Congress. And our system is so fundamentally different you know, that right now when you take a look at, and there was a great CBO study that was done uh, earlier this year that was comparing um, different projections out of the Department of Defense and the CBO projection. They calculated that when you looked at the FIDIP projections that were in the 2012 to 2015, 2017 budget, 
you know, that we were 10% underfunded in terms of meeting, uh, you know, living within our own defense projections during that time. The CBO projections said that they were going to do two things that were different. One, they were going to reflect the reality of what the, government, what the Department of Defense actually did rather than what it said it would do. And two, congressional decisions made in recent years where last year in FY12, the department wanted, made a number of suggestions for how to reduce personnel growth from about 4.5% down to 0.3%. Congress rejected all of them during that time. You know, and, uh, and they've come up that where the Department of Defense is 10% underfunded by its own, it's more like 13 to 15% underfunded by actual reality and what Congress does during that time. And so I agree, you can form the Band of Brothers, change in the strategic culture, people think more jointly, act more jointly, but that's only the beginning of the process in our country. Uh, only the beginning of the process, and it gets torn asunder. It's because the appropriators canoodle. <laughs> I, want, I want to defend uh, a little bit here, to, and I agree with everything you said, by the way, but I do want to make a, at least a spirited defense of the process that produced all my colleagues here. Uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, the Armed Services Committees in both bodies of Congress are run by very, very serious men on both sides. And if you went up there and talked with them, you would find that multi-year planning and multi-year projections are a significant por portion of their lives. And they don't want to fight the last war. They want to fight the next war. It's a serious, serious problem. And we have a huge industrial base in this country that is subject for another discussion that has large and uh, vested interests in, in how our system plays out. The problem we have is that even for people on the Hill who want to think multi-year, because resources are, are, are so limited, we are limited to thinking one year. And the planning capability on the Hill to respond to the planning capability in the executive branch is, is compromised. This is why the biggest priority for our country is we really need an overarching economic deal. That's going to call it a deal, call it an understanding. Only under a big framework can you do the type of multi-year planning that you talk about. If you don't have it, we're, we're, it's, it's just we're by the seat of our pants every year. Well, let me just, uh, actually fascinating comment. I think we're all sort of watching your experience with, uh, with great interest. And I think Jim's right, that, but the, the difference is you had, you wouldn't call it grand, but you had a grand bargain. Uh, we haven't gotten ours yet, and I think the part of the problem is nobody's willing to believe that the numbers are going to turn out. There's this fantasy that exists in the Pentagon that everything gets it fixed in the fit-up or the years beyond the fit-up, and that has not changed. And until there is a number, and I happen to think it's the sequestration number that the department's going to have to live with over the next 10 years, but until people get an agreement on a number, it's just, you know, there's all, they always are delaying the hard decisions in hopes that they don't have to face it. So come back and we'll have further discussions. Thanks for being with us.